Hi everyone, and a warm welcome to a new episode of Let's Talk Sock. Today we're focusing in on the critical topic of ransomware preparedness. And to explore all the latest insights, I'm delighted to be joined now by Eric Escobar, Principal Consultant and Wireless Lead at SecureWorks. Welcome, Eric. Hey, how's it going, Sally? Oh, all good. Very lovely warm weather as well. So it's a lovely way to spend the rest of the day, honestly, Eric, drilling into this really important area. But maybe as a place to start, could you share a bit more about yourself and particularly your role at SecureWorks as well? Yeah, absolutely. So I've uh, been at Skirks for probably about seven years now. It's the absolute best job in the world. On any given day, I am compromising our customers all in the name of making them more secure and making it so uh, a real threat actor, a real bad guy can't break in, compromise and steal ransomware, do all, any of those nefarious things you read about. Absolutely. And it affects every single one of us, doesn't it? In terms of individuals, no families, work life, etc. Really is right up there as a concern that we all share. And I'd love to find out a bit more about your role kind of as a white ha hacker, so to speak. What have you dripped as kind of that involved, basically? But also, what are the most kind of significant attack vectors that you're dealing with at the moment that you could share about, particularly perhaps around ransomware? Yeah, absolutely. So um, with ransomware, somebody basically needs to compromise your systems in order to lock up your files. Um, if you're not familiar with what ransomware is, it's basically where a threat actor like myself or someone in the real world, uh, what they'll do is they'll access a system and they will encrypt it. So they'll make it unreadable to you without the, you know, the special key, so to say. Um, and so really, uh, ransomware is just one of the tail end of how a company gets com compromised. Um, you know, but there are a ton of other different ways that companies can get compromised for a multitude of different reasons. Sometimes they might be compromised to steal, uh, you know, intellectual property information. Sometimes they'll get compromised in order to steal user information, um, to steal proprietary data, code, um, you know, uh, if it's like a hospital system, maybe they want patient data. So all, all of the different stuff. Um, those are all targets of, of, you know, threat actors that are out there. And ransomware is just that tail end of, hey, how can we monetize, um, you know, the access that we have? And so you'll notice we have like all the crazy boxes behind myself. And those are like a lot of the different tools that we do for either physical assessments where we're trying to physically break in somewhere or hardware based assessments where I'm trying to like, you know, desolder chips and gain access to firmware and all that kind of stuff. So it really, it really just goes down the, the whole rabbit hole of compromise. But really at the end of the day, that's what ransomware is. It is locking up your files so that, uh, you know, you have to pay the ransom in order to gain access to them again. Absolutely. I think you really brought to the fore as well, just the dynamism really of the space with so many different kind of new threat vectors as well coming together. Also more collaboration of bad actors too, and just how you know, different things come to the fore. Like for me, I'm doing a lot of work in energy at the moment. So security and energy again, rising up there and even new threats there kind of from ransomware to killware as well. So I mean, really, really dynamic space. So A, thank you for all the work you're doing there, Eric. But B, <laughs> I wanted to flag as well some of the amazing work you're doing at things like DEFCON. I was reading about that as well. So so literally the man, I think, to, to kind of identify any challenge, actually, from I'm seeing your success rate at things like wireless <laughs> CTF. Very, very impressive. I, I thought that was excellent. So really great example there as well. Some of the work Eric does outside of Secure Works too, in terms of kind of identifying challenges and really bringing on new talent too. So I wanted to mention that. I love that. Um, and also for the audience today, perhaps going back to the ransomware subject, you know, in a bit more detail. And again, I appreciate we sometimes need to be anonymous about this from, from client case studies, but perhaps we could share kind of a real world example of how you've supported and kind of how you facilitated customers to boost their defenses more, particularly around these new emergent evolving threats. Yeah, absolutely. So. Gosh, it's one of these things that if you give me seven minutes to talk about this or seven hours, I could, you know, fill that entire gap. So I'm, I'm the goldfish when it comes to, you know, what do we want to talk about, right? Um, when it comes to ransomware and, and the scenario of, you know, how, how can we help our clients better defend themselves against it? Uh, the first step that we like to say is let's let's see if somebody can actually do it. Let's see if a real world threat actor can. And so that's that's a lot of what my role is. My role is let's step in here. I'm gonna you know put my my bad guy hat on and attempt to compromise your company. Attempt to compromise credentials, gain access. Um, you know, uh, see what hosts and servers are available. See where your files actually are. What your backup strategy is. Um, and it's it's very much like going and pulling the fire alarm and seeing hey. How do people react? You know, do they know who to call? Do they know the exit strategies? And in the same way, when we perform a ransom, so we perform a ransomware simulation, essentially, um, is one of the, the offerings that, that like we essentially do here on our team. And so that's really great because what happens then is it forces, you know, the C-suite, the executives, it, it forces the technical people all to say, do we have good backups? If we have good backups, how easily can we recover from them? Do we have critical files, you know, accessible from multiple different backup locations? Are all 
of our backups in the cloud? Do we have some local? Are they offline? Um, what could a threat actor basically have? And so that's the first step of that is basically identifying and saying, hey, what could happen to you if a real world threat actor comes? And then obviously since we're SecureWorks, um, we have the ability to call upon our incident response team, which, you know, they have, you know, they do thousands of these, you know, engagements every single year where they're, you know, evicting threat actors, you know, uh, and then having, you know, to basically decrypt ransomware uh, packages and payloads. Um, and then we also have obviously the Tejas platform, which is, you know, what prevents, uh, prevents a threat actor from potentially even gaining access to your network um, before they can even, you know, uh, uh, try and ransomware you, right? So that's that's kind of the, the three-prong attack that we have. Um, I'm on the adversarial side, but we obviously work closely with the two other prongs of, of the company as well. Fantastic. Excellent. So I love that. So essentially you're kind of doing a, kind of taking the temperature in many ways, identifying where your gaps and weaknesses may be kind of before the threat actor does essentially, but also what I've seen as well. And again, in some organizations I've worked with directly, I've loved the fact that this facilitation, that word there, I think springs to mind about what you then do from that, what actions you can take, but also kind of splitting it, not just from a leadership perspective, but from a tech one and how you align those together as well. I've seen some great work around that. Um, and within this too, like the role of pen testing i think possibly has never been more important obviously there's different flavors of this too isn't there in terms of say external and physical but also wireless internal and very specialized as well perhaps we could drill into that about why pen testing is kind of making a real difference at the moment but also kind of what those different flavors bring and why one might be more beneficial in one context over another Oh, gosh, Sally. Again, you give me seven hours, I could talk about this for <laughs> days and days and days. This is what I, I live, breathe, and eat. If you could see on my other screen right now, um, I'm cracking around 5,700 passwords that have compromised from an organization, and they're all spinning on several graphics cards that you would normally use to play video games, um, but now they're repurposed into cracking passwords. And, and again, the whole it. purpose of this is to basically say, are there weak passwords in this environment for this company, right? And so um, when you talk about pen testing and why it's so important, uh, really it's the tip of the spear, right? This is this is how somebody's going to get in. And so we do uh, you know external penetration tests where we try and compromise your organization from uh, the public internet. And, and not just so much, hey, can we compromise you know your servers that might be on the public internet, but what does the public internet know about you? Have you been involved in breaches? Um, do you have source code that's in something like GitHub? Do you have, do you use any cloud products like Office 365, Azure, uh, Google Cloud. Um, these are all vectors with which, you know, attackers and threat actors that they can try and compromise, you know, any one of our customers, right? Um, we do internal tests where uh, we basically simulate what would happen if uh, an end user were to click on a malicious email, plug in a thumb drive, um, or if you just had a malicious user that meant to do harm to the company. What, what does that look like and what could they do if they are already inside your network and they aim to do something nefarious to you? Um, we have, you know, you kind of mentioned the more exotic things that you can do as far as pen testing goes. Um, I'm wireless technical lead. And so as a part of that, you know, we try and compromise your organization from, uh, you know, from the wireless perspective. So can we, you know, uh, can we compromise your guest network? If your company does have a guest network, can we use it to pivot to, into your corporate network? Can we use it to bypass multi-factor authentication? Uh, for your corporate wireless, can we basically then go from there and say, uh, hey, we are able to, to gain access to that if there's not like certificates in place or any of the other number of protections that are in place? Um, and basically just say, can we gain access to the, the squishy parts of the organization uh, or the crown jewels? And the crown jewels are different for absolutely every organization. And that's where we come in is, is, uh, is we say, hey, where are the things that are sensitive? And we are going to basically write the roadmap of how a threat actor is, gonna, is, is going to be able to access those, those resources. And why that's really powerful is that now if you have a company that has, say, you know, half a million dollars of budget to spend on security tooling, we can now focus that budget down and say, hey, you know what? Um, you know, the things that you thought matter, well, that's not actually how we were able to compromise your, your company. So instead, invest, you know, your remaining budget into these different specific areas that would stop a real world threat actor like myself. Um, and so that's that's a lot of the power as far as like those those basic pen testing, um, you know, uh, offerings that we have, but then we go down like the sliding spectrum of like physical access. So, you know, you'll see behind me, there's uh, over, over my shoulder over here, there's a hard hat, there's a tool that's under the door tool. Um, and basically with those, we do physical pen tests where we try and physically compromise, pick locks, clone key cards, you know, try and do social engineering. Um, and again, those are important because uh, the person that's sitting in the chair behind a workstation is, is, you know, sometimes the weakest link and they'll allow you in and allow you past MFA and, you know, two-factor authentication. 
Um, so doing those types of physical engagements for, for larger companies are, um, they're huge because, uh, you know, that's where you're putting your training, your money and your resources in, uh, into your, your facilities and your staff. Um, and then we even go down the more fun route, which is like more of our red team offering where we essentially try and come in completely cloak and dagger. Uh, and then we have purple team offerings where we can essentially work with the security team that's already in place and say, Hey, did you see this? If you didn't see it, let's start fine tuning your alerting so that, um, so that you can more, uh, actively detect somebody like myself when they're in your, when they're in your network. So we basically do a ton of different scenarios. I mean, we'll even go so far as we have a, a scenario called lost laptop where we will basically uh, say, hey, say your CFO went to the gym and put their laptop in the in their gym bag or in their car, and they come back out to their car and they say, uh-oh, laptop's gone. And we simulate what happens there. Can we compromise that, that uh, hard drive? What ends if they only put their computer to sleep? Those keys are still in memory. And that's where we use the tools behind me right here to basically you know, solder things to different chips, keep everything cool, extract encryption keys from memory, and then gain access to that. And so all that to say that that pen testing is why it's tip of the spears because it can help you allocate resources and find out real ways that a threat actor is actually going to try and breach, you know, your company or organization, or even if you're just a VIP, um, you know, how, how somebody could target you. Oh, absolutely. Hey, I love the holism there of all the different aspects you're considering. I mean, literally is multi-layer in terms of the support that you're giving there. And when you mentioned about that kind of VIP aspect as well, you reminded me of a different example too about, for example, on social media, where quite recently there's been an uptake, for example, in, in C-suite being targeted um, as well and simulation testing. So again, if you get a message you think is from, from that source, what that opens, that, that kind of trickle effect then of communications. And they found the weak link to be, for example, the communication around an incident um, so again stimulation for all types of roles not just tech facing roles you know from a hundred percent point of view because every role is tech and data facing to, to such an extent now so making sure everyone knows their role there um, I think is absolutely critical too so stimulation in all those different aspects you were talking about love the fact you brought that to the fore it's brilliant <laughs> and I was going to ask you there about some of the key kind of benefits of doing this approach you brought out so many there um, very very naturally um, for me I was going to talk about you know validation and assurance I think that's so, so important. But also you mentioned there about, um, about alerts very briefly too. I think another benefit there is helping you to kind of sort through some of the noise there so you can really identify what the, say, high-fidelity alerts might be, particularly when we look at some of the overload in security teams today, but also doing more with less as well and issues like tool sprawl, for example, too. So, again, I think the approach you're mentioning there really helps you to filter through and make the very, very best of your security investment. Yeah, that, and that, that you hit the nail on the head. That's the whole point of it, is that it's not for me or my team to come in and say, hey, we're the bad guys, and like, look how cool and good we are. It's to say, hey, this is what, what is really out there in the real world. This is what you have to defend yourself against, and let's put some reality around it. Um, you know, So again, you can fine-tune those alerts, because that, that's one thing, too, is that if you want to see absolutely every, every single alert that comes in, there's millions of alerts gen generated by a single company any given day. And, you know, the, the key part of that is to find the couple of alerts that say, hey, there's a threat actor in your environment. You need to respond to this um, versus having to sift through all the noise that's out there. That, that is one of those things that, um, yeah, with, with limited staffing, with limited teams or even teams that maybe aren't as sophisticated, trying to find a way in which that they can, they can filter that out, sift through the noise and then stop somebody, you know, stop a threat actor before they, you know, do real harm into the environment. Oh, I couldn't agree more. And maybe just a final point on that, too. Also, another aspect that changes continually, too, but areas like compliance as well. I think it can be really supportive there, you know, whether you're talking about things like um, HIPAA or maybe FFIEC. I mean, so many different ones. I think the geographical differences there, again, are really interesting and they give a lot of support, but they can also add complexity, too. So how you're supporting this about you know, making sure that compliance is kind of by design, so to speak, is also an important part of that confidence as well. Yep, absolutely. And so it's one of those things that we do testing for, you know, a wide variety of industries. You mentioned, uh, you know, HIPAA. HIPAA is like, that's, that's healthcare. We compromise hospitals day in and day out. And that's one of those things that I have a vested interest in making sure that hospitals are safe. My daughter was born in a hospital. My son was born in a hospital. I want to make sure that those Definitely. hospitals are secure. You know, I'm a human that lives in the real world as are, you know, every hacker. And so my, my whole goal is to make sure that those are secure. And so safeguarding that information, making sure that they're compliant and they fit within those compliance regimes is one of those things where, you know, I want to make sure that that information is safeguarded in a, in a particular way that is segregated from other, you know, less uh, important, you know, pieces of information or data on a network. 
Um, and then when you talk about, you know, basically that, that health and life safety, I mean, we do so much testing for operational technology or, you know, OT environments. Um, you know, before before I became a hacker and went to the dark side, I, you know, I have a degree in civil engineering. I'm a registered civil engineer. So, you know, I know what it means when you, when you see, uh, you know, all this critical infrastructure that's now connected to the Internet. You know, now you see sensors that are wireless. You see, you know, all, all these different, um, you know, life and safety things that are now on the Internet and at the mercy of, of, of threat actors that might mean to do it harm, might mean to take it offline, or might mean, um, you know, to, to, you know, make the alerts unusable at some point. So all, all that to say, um, yeah, that, I mean, that's my whole end goal is to make sure that the, the relevant teams that are safeguarding it, that we basically prop them up and say, hey, we're setting you up for success and letting you know what it looks like when a real bad guy comes knocking on your door. I love that setting you up for success. It's very, very well said, Eric. And I think with the kind of the speed and scale, sophistication of changes we're seeing in this space at the moment, I think what you're doing, and particularly that holistic approach that you've brought to the fore there across those different layers, is absolutely critical. Plus the education and everything you do from an threat intel point of view as well. The currency of that and the value of sharing that for the community, I think, is so so important too. So I totally agree with you. We could definitely do seven hours on this, couldn't we? We're really oh, good. Definitely. We have to come back, <laughs> Eric. I think, and perhaps we can do another kind of hackathon approach as well something more in the world uh, or, or, or i could just do show and tell of all the different things that are behind me because i like that uh, i think we like, should I mean, do what's behind you today i think we should do that like, have a this is a graphics there. card like this is a graphics <laughs> card where it's like oh i could crack trillions of passwords on this thing no problem at all right and then i have all the boxes behind me so again I'd be happy to come back and do a show and tell. I love it. We'll have to do that. And again, I'm going to, I'm going to end with the note you did here. So here's my, my cold coffee from earlier. But putting this into context, kind of five of those, if you buy those from a coffee shop a week, that's kind of your entry price to start a ransomware attack today. So again, why this matters so much as well, price of entry for so many has gone down too. So coming together, sharing information like this makes a big difference. And I love the demos in the background, Eric. It's awesome. Thank you <laughs> awesome. so much. Really appreciate Absolutely you joining us today. <laughs> have a good one. Thank you. And thank you all for watching and listening to it's been another episode of Let's Talk Sock. We'll be back soon for more insights into the cybersecurity industry with SecureWorks. Thanks for all for joining us.